evening. Welcome to Karagoda Arts Festival 2021. My name is Nitya. I'm a conservation architect with Art Deco Mumbai Trust. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, Art Deco Mumbai is a public charitable trust founded in 2016. It advocates the conservation of Mumbai's Art Deco buildings, chronicles its history, documents neighborhood, and has created the only online repository dedicated to Mumbai's Art Deco buildings in the public domain. We host walking tours, workshops, and lectures as part of our outreach. And we are so glad that you could join us today for this particular event that is Heritage Unlocked. Um, Anthony Robbins in conversation with me from Art Deco Mumbai Trust. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to now um, welcome Tony to the stage and get, share, us, share with us uh, his talk. Over Thank to you, Tony. Thank you so much, Nietzsche. I'd like to share my screen now. Um, is that showing? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, the uh, Art Deco Society of New York, who, which you see up there on the uh, on the screen, is uh, now about 40 years old. Uh, it was founded to uh, bring attention to Art Deco architecture and, and the arts generally in New York City. Uh, which sounds peculiar to us now because it's Art Deco has become such a well-known style, but 40 years ago, it really wasn't. Um, and it was a, a real change in how we saw our city. Uh, and that's really remarkable because the, the buildings that we call Art Deco are such a big part of the, of the visual identity of New York. Uh, the Chrysler Building, which you see on the screen, maybe one of our best known skyscrapers, maybe one of the world's best known skyscrapers. It's, it image, it, its image shows up everywhere. Um, but truly an icon of, of New York. Uh, the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, um, one if not the most famous hotel, certainly one of the top two or three in New York City. Um, these buildings from around 1930, uh, on either side, late 20s, early 30s, just helped create so much of the image of the, of the modern city uh, that it's really hard to overstate um, their significance. Uh, twin tower apartment houses, there are four of these along Central Park West, which create our residential skyline. Um, so what is, what is this uh, phenomenon that we call Art Deco? Um, the, uh, it goes back to a very uh, influential exhibition that was held in Paris in 1925 with a very long French name, which translates as the International Exposition of Modern Industrial and Decorative Arts. Uh, countries from all over the world participated. Uh, the United States got an invitation to participate and we said no. Um, apparently, our architects thought that we didn't do modern, which I think is remarkable, seeing as how modern is just whatever we are doing right now. That's by definition modern. However, even though we didn't send a, uh, an official delegation, Americans went in large numbers. In fact, it is said there were so many Americans wandering around Paris during the show that it was called New York on the Seine. Um, now, the, uh, once it was over, um, it got sort of gradually forgotten. And then it came back. In 1966, uh, there was a show at the Paris uh, Museum of Decorative Arts. There's the catalog on the left of the screen um, called The Years of 1925. And, and they looked at all sorts of things from that time. They looked at uh, the Bauhaus, right? that's Germany, or style, that would be Holland. And they looked at this show with a very long French name. And uh, my theory is that that name was too long to fit on the cover of the book. So they shortened it to Art Décoratif, which is just decorative arts in French, and maybe that didn't fit either. So voila, Art Déco, the expression was born. That's 1966. Uh, in 1968, a man named Bevis Hillier, who was an arts critic for the Times of London, uh, did a book, he called it Art Déco. Uh, in New York, we had a, uh, a college here that put on a show in 1969, uh, 70, about Art Deco. Bevis Hillier then came over from London, uh, borrowed a lot of the things that had been put together for that earlier show, took them out to the Minneapolis Institute of Arts and put on the show, which you see on the right there, the poster for, A World of Art Deco, 1971. And suddenly this phrase was everywhere. Um, art Deco this and Art Deco that. Uh, to the point uh, that we got, you know, we started to see it everywhere, uh, certainly uh, in furnitures, in every, everything really from salt cellars to skyscrapers, fabric, jewelry, painting, sculpture, anything uh, with an abstract geometric pattern like the uh, clock that you see in the lower left hand corner or that lovely piece of furniture in the upper left hand corner or perhaps flowing drapery like the, the, the women in the uh, picture on the right, uh, but anything like that uh, designed in the late 1920s or the early 30s. 
or the mid 30s or the late 30s, the early 40s, the mid 40s, a few odds and ends even to the late 50s. So it's a fair period of time uh, in Europe and North America and South America and India and China uh, and Indonesia. Uh, I personally think the wrong style got called the international style because it's so widespread, uh, it picked up a, sort of a local flavor. Uh, this is a cartoon that appeared in the New York, New York, uh, the New Yorker magazine, which is an old uh, magazine in New York City. Um, it's a it's a fashionable couple in a gallery, and the caption reads, "Do you realize we are living through the second time that people got tired of Art Deco?" Uh, the joke is that that appeared in 1984, which is getting to be a long time ago. So I think we're still getting tired of it. Uh, so so what is it? Well. Um, it's a style that, for us, it's a style that came to New York in the 20s and transformed the look. You know, New York is, is, by North American standards, New York is an old city, right? Not by Mumbai standards, but by our standards, we're 400 years old. Um, and at the end of the 19th century, we were a large Victorian city. Um, and that's a shot of uh, Fifth Avenue uh, from that period. And um, then came World War I. Uh, we lost soldiers in the war, but we did not. The war didn't physically come to our shores. In other words, we weren't bombed. So when the war was over, Europe was sort of a mess. We were doing a little bit better, and we entered this economic boom called the Roaring Twenties. And suddenly, our, our image changed. Um, and thanks to Hollywood, especially uh, movies took us all over the world. New York emerged with this image of the the, the, the new early modern metropolis. Um, at North America. Um, and uh, what was the style of the day? This very modern looking thing, which we call Art Deco. Uh, and there on the uh, lower right hand corner, there are the new skyscrapers going up in Midtown, make, creating the Midtown skyline. And they are all from this period, just one or two exceptions, but mostly they are. Uh, and this was a period where New York seemed like the Emerald City, like Oz. Uh, if you uh, get a chance to see the, uh, the original movie from the 1930s of The Wizard of Oz, have a look at the the buildings of the Emerald City, they are what we now call Art Deco. So this is what architecture in New York lo looked like before this happened. Uh, New York architects tended to design their buildings with one eye looking over their left shoulder at Europe. And by Europe, they really meant England or France, to a lesser extent, Italy, Spain, or Germany. So there in the upper left-hand corner, that's a building from 1840. It's a custom house. It's Greek revival. Uh, below it is uh, a, a series of houses uh, that are trying to look like the Italian rena Renaissance. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner is Grand Central Terminal. That's a Beaux-Arts French-style building, um, and so on. That's, that's what we did. And then came Art Deco. And, and at the same time, we became a skyscraper city. And this is the new style. Uh, and it really took place in, in skyscrapers. It's not an accident that the first serious book on the subject of New York architecture from this period is actually called Skyscraper Style, because it was. Uh, and the skyscraper style has very, some very particular characteristics. Once, once you know what it looks like, you, 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 you'll see it everywhere in New York. You can't miss it. Uh, buildings are visible in the round. They have vertical windows. We'll, we'll show examples of all of this in a moment. They look like abstract pieces of sculpture. They use geometric patterns, unusual colors, strange new materials, and they tell you who the building is. So let's start with a daily news building. This is built for a very big newspaper in New York. It was the largest uh, circulation newspaper in the country at the time. Uh, it went up on a stretch of, of 42nd Street. You see there on the right of your screen that was not terribly developed at the time. And there it is on the left, towering over it. Um, and it was designed by an architect named Raymond Hood, who was very, very influential in this period. Um, and we happen to know a lot about how it came to be designed because a young architect named Walter Killam went to work for Hood when this building was going up and then wrote a book about it. And so he takes us into the uh, conversations. Uh, you know, why is this so, why is this such a tall building? Uh, it was built for the newspaper that didn't require a skyscraper. Uh, the owner of the paper said, why did you, why are you showing me a skyscraper, Mr. Hood? I'm a newspaper man. I just need a, a printing plant and, and some, you know, offices. I, I don't want a skyscraper. And Hood said to him, well, you see, it's construction's very expensive here in New York, you know, but if you build a skyscraper, you can rent out all the extra space and that'll pay for everything. And he talked the man into buying a skyscraper. So why would he want to do that? Uh, probably a lot of reasons. I think a New York architects dream of doing skyscrapers. Um, but also we, we learned from Killam, it had to do with what Raymond Hood thought was a problem with New York buildings. He thought that New York architecture was not really architecture, that it was fake in a sense. It, very dense city. So buildings are lined up cheek by jowl. There are some 19th century cast iron uh, warehouses on the left and some row houses on the right. And you can see the fronts of the building and they have lovely designs, 
But what you're looking at is two dimensional. How deep do those buildings go back in the lot? You can't see. Um, what do they look like behind there? You can't see. And to Hood, that's two dimensions. It's like a painting and architecture is three dimensions. So how do you get around that with, uh, in a place like New York? Well, you put your building up in the air and then people can see it uh, in the round. And so here's the Daily News building on the left and you certainly see it in the round, but there's more going on. You'll notice that we can see the entire front, right? The, the facade on, on your left, because it's on the street. We can also see the other side, the uh, on the right, the uh, Western facade, because it looks like it's on the corner of another street, but it isn't. That is not a street, that is an alley. Look on the image in the lower right-hand corner, that's the alley, and that alley wasn't there. Raymond Hood put it there, and we learned from Killam that he put it there so that we could see this building in the round. Uh, but there's more going on, uh, and that has to do with the setbacks. The setbacks are, come from a law that had to do with early skyscrapers going up. When the first skyscrapers went up, there were very few regulations, and they just simply went straight up, like the building you see on the left, the Equitable Life Insurance Company, um, it, it was vast and it blocked light and air. And this was a problem. So in 1916, New York City passed a resolution uh, requiring setbacks in tall buildings. And there's an example on the right. Uh, and the way it works is that the law defines a diagonal line. And when you're building, you hit a certain point, you must set back along the diagonal. You can almost, if you look at those setbacks, you can almost see the imaginary diagonal line. Uh, and therefore more light would hit the street. Uh, so they, uh, Architects had a lot of fun with this, uh, playing around with what you might do with all of these extraordinary setbacks. There you see some wonderful images on the right by Hugh Ferris, who was one of the best known architectural renders of the day. On the left is more the uh, bureaucratic point of view. This is how the city uh, managed it. So um, Hood uh, hired somebody to make some studies of what would be possible on the site, which you see there on the left, but he designed what you see on the right, which is quite different. And Killam talks about going into Sea Hood in his office, finding him standing next to one of these models with a carving knife in his hand. And he said to young Killam, oh, don't mind me, I'm just doing a little zoning. And he started to slice pieces off the building. He was shaping it like a piece of abstract sculpture. And this is the result. You know, where's the corner on this building? It's hard to pin down because it moves because of the setbacks. This we're going to see on dark Beckel buildings of all kinds. Then there's the windows. There are really only two ways to do windows on all buildings, at least in this period. There's the horizontal way, which you see on the left, and the vertical way, which you see on the right. The vertical way goes back to uh, Louis Sullivan in Chicago, who was one of the uh, innovators in skyscrapers and said that, you know, I want people to see my skyscraper, to see the, how tall they are. I want them to look up. How do I make them look up? Well, I'll put the windows in vertical stripes. It will pull their eye up and you'll look and look and look and say, oh my gosh, look how tall that is. This became so important to the, the Art Deco period. You know, remember the phrase didn't exist yet. What did architects call this style? They called it the vertical style. That's how significant it was to them. And you'll see this on six story apartment buildings as well as 40 story skyscrapers. Uh, then the ornament, typical classical ornament looked like this, right? Taken off of ancient buildings from Rome and, uh, and Greece. Art Deco ornaments completely different. It's inventive, it's color, it's geometry, it's abstract, it's new. It doesn't look like anything that came before. And you'll see this all over. Um, and so color and geometry. Look, there's a, a skyscraper from 1910 on the left, the old MetLife Tower. It's monotone. Uh, it's classically oriented. It's modeled on an ancient building in uh, Venice, the uh, library of St. Uh, pardon me, the Tower of St. Mark's. And there's the Daily News building on the right. Red, white, and black geometric patterns, not modeled on anything. Here's its entrance. In this period, the, entry, the buildings try to tell us who, they're, who they are, what they're for. So at the top, you see the name of the news. Okay, well, that's the name of the newspaper. Then there's this, the people of the busy city going back and forth. Of course, it's 1930, so they're dressed in period clothing. That young woman in the, in the middle who's bending over is dressed as a flapper, short skirt and that funny little hat. Um, and then there's the expression, you see the uh, inscription, he made so many of them, that refers to something that our President Lincoln once said, God must have loved the common people, he made so many of them. That's who reads the newspaper, the common people, it's a, it was a tabloid and that appealed to the owner. And then at the top, there's an image of the skyscraper itself with the sun rising behind it. This happens over and over again in these skyscrapers, the buildings become part of the ornament. The lobby inside was more like a planetarium than a lobby because the owner of the paper thought he was educating his readers and he would do it even in his buildings. Uh, this has been somewhat altered, the walls are down, but it's still there. That globe actually does turn on its axis. And what you see is the same thing in a sense that you see outside, color, geometry, but put to educational uses here. Uh, probably the most famous of these buildings, the Chrysler building. Um, 
tallest building in the world when it opened in 1930. Uh, and it looks very different from the Daily News building, and yet it's got so many of the same things. You certainly see it in the round, it takes up an entire city block. It's got vertical windows for the most part. There's color in the materials. There's invented geometric ornament. Look at the top of the, of the building especially. It also tells you who it's for. Uh, about 20 stories up, up in the upper left-hand corner is this odd thing that looks like a, a loving cup with wings. Well, what it is, is a, an image of the uh, radiator cap of a 1929 Chrysler automobile, which you see in the lower right-hand corner, but, but blown up to 20 feet. Uh, and next to it is this series on the upper left-hand corner of, of circles. They're the tires of a 1929 Chrysler automobile. So they're telling you this is, this is a Chrysler. In the same way that the Daily News building has symbols suggesting the Daily News, this has symbols suggesting Chrysler. Uh, fabulous invented uh, geometric patterns for the uh, entrance, wonderful uh, glass and metal patterns, all abstract geometrically. Here's the lobby. That ceiling is actually flat. It's The ceiling looks slanted because the lobby is triangular in shape, um, but covered in beautiful colored marble, all sorts of abstract patterns. Notice the marble patterns, they go up. It's the vertical style even inside. Uh, and on the ceiling, there's a portrait of the building. Much as we saw a portrait of the Daily News building at the Daily News, here's a portrait of the Chrysler building on the ceiling of the lobby. Uh, the Empire State Building, probably our most famous building, I think, even today. We don't think of it as Art Deco because it's, it's just the Empire State Building, and it doesn't look quite as much as it did once. That image on the left is what it looks like. The top silhouette has been changed by that uh, television mass that was put on top of it. The original you see on the right, and you see the difference, it suddenly looks blocky or more geometric. That's the original look. That's why it's an Art Deco building. Uh, has the vertical windows. Um, has this extraordinary thing at the top, which was actually meant to be a mooring mast for dirigibles, which never happened. It was impractical, but it was a great opportunity to put up a huge geometric piece of metal in the sky. Uh, the lobby looks almost like a chapel. And at the far end where the altar of the chapel might be is an image of the Empire State Building with the sun rising behind it. Again, this is something that happens over and over again. Here is the uh, RCA building, later GE. Um, same things we see. It's uh, You see it in the round. It's got a curving corner. Notice that to make sure our eye turns the corner and we see it in the round. Then the setbacks and the tower rising. Uh, the top, this uh, odd piece of sculpture, is the spirit of radio, because this was for the Radio Corporation of America. Um, this is what uh, it looks like close up, looking up the corner. And here are some of the details. A hand holding a lightning bolt, representing the electricity or, or sound waves, take your pick. Um, two hands holding a lightning bolt with, behind that, which you can't see is the light that lights the clock uh, beneath it. But th this is an extraordinary building. The more you look, the more you see. Uh, I could show you hundreds of images and we could, we'd be here all day. We can't do that. Uh, take my word for it, it's remarkable. Downtown in the Wall Street District, one Wall Street uh, from this period. Look at the doorway. Um, it's all abstracted. Um, and you're looking in through those remarkable windows at the ceiling inside this room. It's covered in mosaics, gold, yellow, and red. You'll notice they're darker at the bottom and lighter at the top. It's again the vertical styles to lead our eye from the bottom um, to the top. And the mosaics were by Hildreth Meyer. It's recently been rediscovered. Um, and her work is just extraordinary, as you can see. So uh, this is a group of, of New York architects for a, dressed up for a fancy ball to raise money for a, uh, a, a, an, an architectural school that didn't charge tuition. And they've all dressed as their buildings. And in the middle, there's William Van Allen, the architect of the Chrysler Building, dressed as the Chrysler Building. And this may seem rather egotistical, but, and I suppose it is, but these architects are the people who created that skyline. They created these buildings. These are all these Art Deco buildings. There's the Chrysler building. There's the Waldorf Astoria. There's the GE building uh, that made New York, New York in the 20th century. I think they, they're entitled to wear their costumes. So the style spread uh, up in the Bronx, uh, which is a district of New York that's, oh, about 10 miles uh, north of the uh, center of town. Uh, very large uh, uh, boulevard called the Grand Concourse that originally had very, you know, it still has mostly six story buildings. They were very plain with some European details sort of pasted on them. Then came the Daily News building, which all the architects knew about. And there's the new Grand Concourse. The style has come, the skyscraper style has come to a residential neighborhood. This building even has a skyline, even though it's a six-story apartment house, it's not a skyscraper. Um, the details, terracotta. Um, and it, you know, just, it's, it's inventive, it's colorful. Um, it's the skyscraper style. It's done inexpensively because these are apartment houses, not multi-million dollar skyscrapers, but it's the same phenomenon. 
Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a huge mosaic. It's about six foot tall at the front door of one of these apartment houses on the Grand Concourse. It's goldfish. Um, and it's still there. And the people who live in the building are very proud of it. Um, but all kinds of buildings in New York picked this up. This is a department store in the borough of Queens. Um, and even the windows look a little in the way they're surrounded. They look almost like a skyscraper themselves. The uh, here we can better fish, you know, picture on the right. Uh, there's beautiful um, glazed terracotta that you see there on the left. Um, subway buildings, you know, this, this our underground service. Um, not a big budget item really for when it comes to decoration, but this most it's underground, but when it comes above ground, in 1930, uh, they thought we had to make an effort to make it look nice. And so you see, again, it's it's simple, but it's it's all brick, but it's art deco detailing. It's that same geometric patterning, abstract. You certainly see it in the round. Um, it's, it's all there. Uh, Rockefeller Center, which must be the most famous building complex in New York, also from this period, Raymond Hood, the same architect who did the Daily News building where we started, was the chief architect for Rockefeller Center. And, and you can see it, it's, it they're, they're similar buildings. There's just a lot of them. Um, this is the uh, famous skating rink in, in front of the RCA Tower. Uh, and what's a part of this is Radio City Music Hall, um, this extraordinary 6,000 seat theater, which uh, looks like the sun is rising over us. Uh, so that though this, I've just shown you a handful. Uh, these buildings were once the, the tip of modernism in New York. Now they're historic landmarks. Uh, they're 90 years old. Uh, this picture is, was taken on the 50th anniversary of Rockefeller Center. What you're looking at is a cake in the shape of the RCA Tower uh, for the 50th anniversary. And the uh, man, just one in from the uh, left, is uh, David Rockefeller, who is carving a piece of cake. Um, and we continue to celebrate these buildings because really they are the buildings that have uh, created New York. Um, we can talk about this in the QA Q&A session, but uh, are they historically, are, are they preserved as historic buildings? Yes, they most certainly are. It took a while to, for the city to decide that was important. The early buildings that were made landmarks were not from this period at all. They were much older. But uh, everything that we saw today just about is a landmark, plus all these others on the right. There are dozens more, skyscrapers, apartment houses, historic districts, because it's such an important style in New York. And you know, really when we come to New York, either day or night, and we see the Chrysler building, we know we're home, that we couldn't be any place else but New York. This, this is what New York looks like, and it's thanks to these buildings. Um, if you'd like to uh, follow up with a little bit more information, two suggestions. On the lower right, there is the website artdeco.org of the New York Art Deco Society, which has a lot of wonderful stuff. Um, for specifics about buildings, the uh, I've, I've put a little tiny URL.com at the top about Deco New York. That will take you to my website where you'll find a list of all of the different landmarks uh, that are Art Deco, plus links to their official research reports, and then a list of Art Deco books, uh, interviews with architects from the period, which I was lucky enough to do 40 years ago. You'll find a write-up of that uh, and some links. So um, I hope you find that helpful if you're interested. Um, and uh, if you ever make it to New York, I, I hope to uh, take you around on a walk sometime. So over back to you, Nitya. Thank you so much for sharing um, your presentation with us, Anthony. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And I thought it was wonderful uh, to see so many Art Deco buildings that are part of the city of New York and also get to know how um, a lot of the owners and the architects are trying to express themselves in such beautiful manner on the buildings itself. Um, I'd love to uh, talk a little bit more about all these buildings and you know how uh, a lot of them have actually made it to the heritage listing um, in New York, maybe during the Q&A session. Yeah. So through my presentation right now, I'd like to give a brief overview of what you uh, might see in terms of Art Deco buildings in the city of New York and how it all really started. Of course, through uh, Anthony's presentation, he spoke a lot about you know, how uh, the style really came into being globally and how it actually got its name and eventually got to New York. But in the case of uh, Mumbai, I think how it really got to uh, Mumbai is because of the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869. Uh, I think this event had a, a really big impact because it helped sort of revive the trade, um, trade routes and it actually cut the travel time between Bombay to Europe by two weeks it would have otherwise taken a month for people to travel. So by this reduction of time, I thought um, a lot of trade sort of accelerated. And also 
Um, in terms of pleasure, we had a lot of tourism that started to happen. A lot of people now wanted to travel to Mumbai and then move on to see other parts of the city, uh, other parts of the country, really. Uh, they came in through ocean liners at that point in time and docked at the ports of Mumbai and thereafter moved on to go and see all the other parts of the country. Uh, and while this was happening, it's also important to note that the city's uh, port uh, was really expanding. The city was becoming a commercial center and it was a thriving trading port. So a lot of people, educated and prosperous middle class, were also growing in the city. And this need um, led to the need for, um, you know, housing within the city as well. You had a lot of re reclamation of land, you had a lot of restructuring, and you also had a lot of suburban development that happened within the city of Bombay in order to ensure that um, all these new people who are coming in search of opportunities and all the old people who are, um, uh, becoming um, prosperous have uh, family homes where they can stay. While all these restructuring was happening, there was also a lot of use of concrete that you could see in the uh, in shaping the landscape of uh, Mumbai. You had uh, this ACC cement is just an advertisement uh, to show you how there was an extensive use of the material throughout the city to build a lot of things and Art Deco buildings were one such um, entity and result um, of this uh, availability of this construction material. And while all these buildings were being built, uh, the city's first Art Deco district came into being. Uh, it was actually built on reclaimed land uh, and it's known as the Church Cake neighborhood. And it, was, it happened so in the mid 1930s. Um, this actually is situated along the western edge of Oval Medan, and I'll talk a little bit more about this at a later point in the presentation. Of course, because it's large areas of land that are being developed into um, bigger uh, neighborhoods and the city is actually growing, this, uh, these neighborhoods almost functioned like new cities, and that meant that they required new architecture which at that point was called streamline modern. Um, of course, the, uh, the style came from Paris, like uh, Tony mentioned, and it actually fit the aspirational bill. It actually enabled all these new um, people who were coming into the city to actually build their own family homes and live uh, within the city and prosper. While this was happening, there's also another major event that shaped the way all these buildings were being built on a more urban level. Um, of course, a lot of us know that um, the bubonic plague that hit Bombay in 1896 had made, played a very significant role in sort of shaping and making people rethink of how um, buildings should be built, neighborhoods should be built in the city of Bombay. And, the most positive and direct fallout of this particular um, plague was the creation of the Bombay City Improvement Trust. This institution actually mandated in the improvement of the city's commerce, provide better sanitation and facilities, infrastructure facilities to the people. So um, while all this was happening, there were a lot of different uh, rules, building regulations and zoning restrictions that were imposed in the way people could build in the early 20th century. So I'll now begin by talking about one of the first uh, set of buildings that were created in Bombay in the early 20th century in the Art Deco style of building. Uh, the yellow line that you actually see on the photograph here that is where the water land really ended and water uh, of the Arabian Sea came up to. So all the palm trees that you see along oval, uh, the oval that you see on the photograph, um, it is from this line onwards that you actually had the buildings, uh, the land being reclaimed and new buildings being built. So what really happened is that you had all this area that you see as yellow arrows, 
all of that land being created and thereafter you had the first set of buildings being built. This reclamation was really necessary because what was happening is, if you notice in the same photograph right on the top, uh, you see there's a lot of congestion. There's a lot of buildings being built, but there isn't enough space. So when these buildings were being built, they were being more cautious of how they should build these new buildings and how they should look and appear. Just uh, as a side note over here, the, the circle, the yellow circle that you see on the image itself is actually the Mumbai uh, port area, docks area. So just to give you a perspective of how, uh, where we are situated in the city itself. This is also another photograph of that same area. So over here, what you see is right in the middle is the oval medan, which we saw as an oval shape in the previous photograph. Uh, in the foreground, you see all the Victorian Gothic buildings. And on the background, all these buildings that you see with the uniform height, these are the Art Deco buildings that were built in the 1930s. And this is the first time they're being built. Um, a modern uh, city was being built, almost creating the first precinct of Art Deco. Uh, notice how all these buildings are of the same height and you know form a very uniform uh, space, uh, a very uniform and homogeneous uh, uh, neighborhood. And Right at the back, you'll see the ocean. That's where we're going off next. Uh, this is the photograph of the Marine Drive area. Uh, notice how these buildings also follow a same guideline. There are wide roads in front. You have a setback. Uh, by setback, what I mean is the buildings aren't necessarily built directly on the property line. There is a certain distance uh, that they are set back from the property line and that's when the buildings are built. So what you would actually see is between each building, you see a significant amount of space left. What this did is this actually enabled a lot of light and ventilation to come through and um, really make all these buildings very uh, healthy, livable spaces. Um, of course, these areas were part of the building, first building reclamation. And while they were being built, there were quite a few restrictions that were imposed in terms of the urban form of the building itself, uh, both in the oval and in the marine drive area. Things such as where buildings should be situated, what should be their purpose, what kind of structural design should be employed to build these buildings, the finishes and the color all of these were actually governed by a specific uh, building um, regulation. And this was over and above all the regulations that were imposed by the municipal corporation itself. Um, this is another photograph of the same area, Marine Drive. Uh, here, it's actually very evident that sweep that you see and all the uniformity that you see in the height of the buildings and how all these buildings have lots of windows that actually enable you to take in a lot of the breeze that comes in making these spaces very healthy spaces to live in. Uh, what's also very interesting to note is that all the plots that are along the Marine Drive, they, use, they were supposed to only be used for residential purposes. So that's still the case, which is why all the buildings on Marine Drive are still residential buildings. Uh, family homes, apartment blocks, etc. Another practice that one could see in, um, in Mumbai at that point in time in the early 20th century was this practice of arcading commercial building fronts. By that, what I mean is that most of the buildings, the front facade of the building actually had uh, arcades that were created, which enabled people to walk through them and still access shops, restaurants without having to face the harsh sun or get wet during the monsoon season. So the photograph that you see over here on uh, your left actually shows that beautiful arcading. Mind you, this is something you will see in all sorts of uh, all the different styles of architecture across Bombay. But what makes this interesting is, even though this was a guideline that was put in place by the municipal corporation, uh, when designing to the Art Deco style, they tried to ensure they 
created and used all these interesting features like over here, the ziggurat feature, which is like the step profile into the design of the building itself. Another um, very significant rule that you see being employed um, in a lot of parts uh, of the city that were being built at that point in time uh, by the Improvements Trust was the 63.5 degree angle rule. What this really meant was that when the heights of the buildings were really being decided, they ensured that from the edge of the property line, um, they would actually create a line, uh, angular line of 63.5 degrees and the height of the building had to be within that guideline, that viewpoint itself. What this enabled is that uh, enable the buildings to actually have a lot of light and um, good air the way uh, they were being designed even in other parts of the city. One such area where the 63.5 degree rule was employed is the King Circle, which you see over here in the photograph itself. Also notice how all the buildings around the circle over here how they are all of a uniform height and they're very beautifully built. This was very intentional, mind you. The city engineer also actually made sure that the designs were approved in such a way that this circle, when it was completed, will actually, from an architectural point of view, be a very beautiful circle. Um, another rule that actually you see used within the design within the urban design of the buildings of our deco period in Bombay is the setback rule itself. Uh, what this actually meant is when the setback rule, which is moving a little further into the property line, along with the height restriction was combined, you actually saw the step profile being created and um, Eros building that you see over here, Eros Cinema, is a very fine example of this. By step profile, what I really mean is, notice the blue lines that I've highlighted in the presentation image itself. Uh, that's the profile they were trying to create. And in a lot of cases, you would actually see this also called as the ziggurat style uh, and expressed in two-dimensional form, not just in the three-dimensional form as a step profile. Um, another very interesting thing about Art Deco in Bombay is that it is not just restricted to the South Mumbai section, which is the Marine Drive or the Oval Maidan area. You can actually see them in numerous other neighborhoods within the city itself, such as Kolaba, uh, Malabar Hill, Mohammed Ali Road, Kambala Hill, Baikala, Worli, Dadar, Matunga, Mahi, Bandra, Chembur. It's the works. So we really have a lot of Art Deco buildings within the city of Mumbai, and they are very, very different in different parts of the city. So they actually in incorporate the cultural and social landscape of the uh, neighborhood while they are designing uh, uh, these buildings in the early 20th century. It's not just that. What's also interesting is you see a lot of different typologies of buildings in the city of Mumbai as well that have used Art Deco style of architecture. So you see healthcare properties. So by that, I mean hospitals. You see apartment homes. Uh, so you see bungalows. You can see apartment complexes. You see educational institutions. So you have high schools. Um, colleges that are actually built in Art Deco style. You see commercial buildings, so you have office buildings, you have um, insurance buildings that are actually in the commercial style, uh, commercial buildings. You have entertainment spaces, by that I mean you have uh, cinema theaters, clubs, uh, places of social in interaction. Uh, you have clubs, you have uh, places of worship as well. Uh, that are designed in this. So I'll just run you through a few examples of such buildings. Um, we have first the Purandere Hospital, which is again designed by Gregson, Batley and King. And it's beautiful to just look at the um, architectural lettering that you see on the right. And then the step-like profile that you see in the marble cladding at the entrance, again, evident in the right photograph. Uh, you then also have apartment complexes like the Seaface Park. 
uh, over here um, that was built by Master Sati and Kuta. Uh, you have, again, Ismail Beg Muhammad High School from Mohammed Ali Road, uh, which is built in this beautiful style of architecture. Notice the rising sun motif just above the, win just between the two windows uh, that you see on the image itself. And if you notice in the center lower section of the image, you'll also see the name of the school written in the Urdu uh, language over here. Uh, you also have financial institutions like the Reserve Bank of India that has been built in this style. Uh, you have Liberty Cinema, one of my favorite cinema theaters uh, to be built in this style as well. Uh, you have hotels like the Sea, sea Cream Hotel built in this style. This is actually a very unique uh, building. Um, because what really has happened here is they have actually used the rectilinear form and really embraced that to create the beautiful uh, urban form and detailing within the building itself. Very different from a lot of the curvilinear forms one is uh, notices on buildings, art deco buildings in the city itself. And finally, you also have uh, the Cricket Club of India being designed in the art deco style uh, built in the 1937. And you have a gyari such as this being built in the city of Bombay in the early 1940s. Other than these typologies, what's also interesting to note is the way Art Deco was expressed in the city of Bombay. Uh, you saw them uh, employing tropical imagery, nautical features, making sure all these buildings are climate responsive, they uh, allow a new way of living and also tell somewhat of a native story of how India would have been when these buildings were being created. So to begin with, I'll just show you a few images and help you understand these concepts a little better. We first have Port View along Oval. Uh, on the left, you'll notice this beautiful uh, relief work that you would see at the end, just above the entrance of the building. This actually is a frozen fountain feature that you would see on the building. And this is actually predominantly used in uh, Bombay because Bombay is a tropical city. So the fountain is considered a tropical imagery that is incorporated into the building itself. Next, we have Shireen Mansion in the Tardeo neighborhood. Uh, this building, if you notice on the right, has this beautiful relief work just at the street corner facade. Uh, the relief work itself, if you'd notice, actually takes uh, a lot of in inspiration from the nautical theme, the fact that the city is a port city, trading port as well. The next building we're going to talk about is Shiv Shanti Bhavan. This is actually a very interesting building and a fine example of how buildings should be built today. Uh, and how buildings were built at that point in time. If you notice, it has very interesting features on its building itself. It has eyebrows, which are actually these semicircular details that you see on the left, almost 15 of them stacked one on top of another. And then it also has a lot of windows and balconies. So for balconies, I'd like you to point, look at the right side image as well. What all these features really did is all these features actually made sure that the building was full of natural sunlight and it actually uh, also had very cool breeze that moved through the building as well, making these spaces very, very comfortable. Until even recently, I don't think they even needed air conditioning to keep themselves very comfortable within these building spaces. The next building I'd like to talk about is this beautiful uh, building, Dhanraj Mahal. This was actually built as an urban palace uh, because we had a lot of princes who were coming to the city of Bombay to actually meet and treat at the Taj Hotel. So very close to that hotel is this beautiful building, uh, which draws inspiration also from the Egyptian style um, of our Egyptian motifs. And um, that's a very beautiful example. Uh, it, it, it's a very beautiful example of seeing how very interesting motifs can be incorporated into the building. 
uh, to create a very fine and uh, tall building. And finally, we have this beautiful building in front of us, the New India Assurance. This building was built by the architectural firm of Master Sati and Kusa. And what I like to highlight here really is the relief work that you see on the building and the story that these relief work are trying to say. Um, there's an image on your right of the relief work itself. You see this larger than life uh, relief work at the entrance of the building. Uh, I specifically like to point out the Indian clothing that you see on the relief work itself. If you notice, the men are actually wearing dhoti. Um, there's also a woman who's actually on a hand loom and she's actually clad with sari. Uh, also notice that you actually see that the man, the tallest man in the relief work is actually an industrial labor and the one behind him on your left actually is running the lathe. So in many ways, actually, what it's trying to showcase is how our cultural and social landscape was at that point in time. We had people who looked very close to what you see in these um, relief work. And you had a lot of emphasis on the textile trade because that trade was at the heart of the economy at that point in time in the country. Why we have such beautiful buildings in place, it's actually very important to note what re very recently happened uh, to our city. Uh, a very significant development in the protection of some of the Art Deco buildings in the city, which is that the Victorian Gothic and Art Deco ensembles of Mumbai was inscribed as a World Heritage Site. This was, of course, a 14 year long journey and interesting, uh, the most interesting thing about it was that it was a citizen-led initiative. Uh, you basically had citizens who were part of residential associations, conservation architects, nonprofit organizations, philanthropists, who were all coming together to make sure that they are able to preserve and conserve a, 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 a beloved part of the city that actually was an urban ensemble that uh, was unique for the juxtaposition that you saw in the two distinct architectural groupings that were seen within this um, World, Mon World Heritage Site. Uh, this World Heritage Site mm -hmm. actually is 66.34 acres uh, big, and it actually has 92 properties, of which 76 are Art Deco buildings. And I think that's a very huge thing because it's actually an inscription where the modern heritage of our country is actually being represented in a very big number. Of course, this particular inscription means that we have uh, our Art Deco buildings being protected on a global level and part of a global uh, heritage list. But there is still some lack of protection that, and less representation that you would see in the local, state, and national registers. So what can we really do about it, right? How can we make a difference? We could spread awareness through outreach. You could engage with diverse group of people. And you could also support ongoing um, conservation work. And I think that's pretty much where our organization has been focused on uh, from the get-go. We've actually tried to make sure that it's a bottom-up approach where we empower the people of the city. Uh, we develop appreciation for Art Deco by engaging with people through lectures and workshops that are shown here. We also love conducting heritage walks and um, lectures for school children because I think they, you are never too young to learn, uh, you're never too young to learn and engage with your city's architecture. And it's very important that you do that at a young age because you learn to value them even more. We also have understand the value of teamwork and what we have been trying to do through this uh, wonderful opportunity we got uh, very recently is that we have been able to work with different kinds of people, which is we've been able to engage with owners, residents, uh, we've been able to work with contractors and uh, with 
a team of experts who have been able to help us in conserving uh, this beautiful and priceless uh, bas relief work uh, on the Swastik Court building along Oval. Mind you, this is just a tiny bit of the work that we have done with the uh, residents of the building. And it has been very beautiful and rewarding. We've also made sure that we actually can enable uh, the residents to uh, preserve what is of value on that building itself and make sure that they are able to um, conserve and cherish them for a very long time. Uh, with this, I think we're at the end of the presentation and I think we should now move on to our Q&A session. So I'd like to invite Tony back uh, so that we can take over questions from everyone else. So um, I think we have a few questions that have come in, but before we get started with that, uh, Tony, I had a question specifically for you. Um, the building regulations in Bombay were largely influenced by building costs uh, you know, the need for open space, even light and air. Uh, could you touch up a little bit more about uh, what really influenced the building rules in New York? Um, and talk a little bit more about that. New York didn't really have any, <clears throat> pardon me, building regulations before 1916. There were fire codes and things like that. Uh, and like, codes like this everywhere, they're generally in response to a disaster. A disaster happens, oh my gosh, we can't, we'll, we'll, we'll try to keep that from happening again. Uh, the zoning resolution of 1916 was the first in the country. Um, and it was mostly about what it sounds like, zones. This is a residential zone, you can't build a glue factory there, that, that kind of thing. But at the same time, our skyscrapers had been developing uh, in the 1880s and the 1890s, and they were going up on the streets of the Wall Street District, which is the oldest part of the city. It's, it's basically the, the streets laid out by the, for the colony, by the Dutch 400 years ago. And they're very narrow, of course, because the Dutch didn't have buildings that were more than one story tall. Well, when you start putting 40 story buildings on top of streets that were meant for one story buildings, what disappears? The light and the air. And that's where the first regulations came in. And that's what was about the, that's what the setbacks were about. That's real interesting. They talked about different ways of doing it. They talked, well, why don't we have a height limit? New York City has never had an absolute height limit. Other cities have had Chicago, one, not anymore, of course, but Chicago once had a height limit. I think the only major American city with one today is Washington, D.C., um, but not in New York. We, we like height, apparently. Um, so instead, we got the, the setbacks. Um, and it's a, it was a very specific formula. Uh, you could only go up from, you could start at the sidewalk line, and you could go up, but only to a certain point. And the formula it was based on the area of the lot on which you were building, the width of the street and a number assigned to this part of town by the zoning resolution. So it would be a business district, and then it's going to be denser. And if it's residential, it won't be less dense. Uh, and, and that was in effect from 1916 to 1961, uh, which is a long period of time. Um, that's probably the best known. When it comes to residential buildings, light and air are more of an issue. Uh, for, for uh, living conditions. And so in 19, I think it was 2021, we got uh, a series, actually at the state level, not the city level, I believe, I have to double check that. I'm not positive about that part. Uh, but you had to have either a courtyard in the back or towers, individual towers, like the Twin Tower oh, Department House at the very beginning. Um, and it's all about letting light and air. And some of those apartments in those buildings, the large ones had four exposures, because you know, it was a fairly narrow tower. Um, and these evolve over time. Uh, one of the, you know, you talked about the economics. Um, yes. You saw skyscraper. you saw multi-million dollar skyscrapers and modest yes. apartment houses. Um, and the modest apartment houses were built during the depression, the great depression okay. of the thirties. Uh, now, not everybody was out of work. A third of the nation was out of work, but the other two thirds weren't. And so people did, you know, have money to move into buildings, but cost was nevertheless a very big issue. And one of the advantages of Art Deco from that point of view is you don't need to spend a lot of money. You don't have to hire a raft of sculptors and painters and mosaics. I mean, you can, and obviously some of them have that kind of thing. All you need to do is put your windows in a vertical row, change the color of the brick, maybe put a little pattern in and you have a nice stylish up-to-date building and it's just not that expensive. Um, and that probably had a lot to do with it as well. What was the other part of your question? I think uh, also, 
I think that was really it. I just wanted you to talk a little bit about and help us understand really how uh, building zones were created in New York itself. Another very interesting thing I noticed in your uh, presentation, which uh, I think you just very briefly touched upon, was um, you know the ornamentation in New York's deco buildings. Mm -hmm. I noticed that they are actually very colorf colorful and especially contain a lot of metallic color, which is very unlike Bombay. Uh, in Bombay, we see a lot more of course, see a lot of color, but they're not actually metallic. So uh, do you know there's any specific reason uh, or any influence for such colors being used in New York? Um, that's, I don't know specifically about metallic colors. Um, what I can tell you is that metals, alloys, uh, the color shows up in the metal itself. Uh, metal alloys were suddenly becoming uh, common. There were all sorts. There was, neat, neat, well, the metal at the top of the Chrysler building, for instance, was a non-rusting alloy of nickel, chrome, and steel. It came from a German company. It's called Nie Rusta, which is German for it never rusts. And before that time, you, you couldn't possibly put metal on an outside of a, of a skyscraper because if you don't maintain the metal, it rusts and falls off. And who's going to walk next to a 60-story building with pieces of rusty metal falling off the top? Right. But once you had a non-rusting mm -hmm. alloy, you could do it. Then there was uh, nickel silver, which is neither nickel nor silver, but that's its name. Uh, Monel. There were a bunch of these. And they have different colors, um, and they, so they so you find different color metal next to different color brick. Um, the ornament itself is interesting. Uh, one of the uh, early apartment houses in the Deco style was by Raymond Hood, the architect of the Daily News Building and also Rockefeller Center, uh, and it won an award from uh, the local chapter of the Architects Institute of America. And they got a little write-up, you know, why, why the award? And they talked about different things, but then they said, when it came to the ornament, they said, and they invented the ornament themselves and didn't get it out of a book. Oh, up interesting. Until point, up until that point, every architect who could manage it had a library of European architecture, mostly also around the world as well, but predominantly European. Uh, and, you know, you imagine, I, I, want, a, I want a house. Oh. Come on in, Mr. Uh, Mr. Robbins, I'm your architect. Um, I've got this book here of wonderful houses in England. Let's see if we can find a good model for you. Would you like Tudor or would you like Georgian? Um, if it's a church, oh, there's wonderful. I've just got some great pictures of Gothic churches in France. Uh, got it out of a book. The ornament right. of buildings is inventive, which is why they all look different. I mean, there are certain right. things that show up. The frozen fountain, you showed something with a frozen fountain. We have those in New York as well. They're, they're everywhere. It was a very popular thing, but it hadn't right. existed before. This was invented by, you know, for, for the style. Um, yeah, that's so, actually very interesting because even in Bombay, I think what has happened is a lot of the ornamentation that you see is one of a kind and you see them actually specifically on each building. So it's different on each building. It might be very similar. Like, we have a lot of insurance buildings who, uh, where you see a lot of native stories being told or, you know, stories associated with Indian mythology, but each one of them is very different from another. So it's almost like they were custom making all these ornaments, uh, like you mentioned, in case of New York it as didn't, well. Didn't get a book. That's, that's what's going to happen, which is what, you know, our, one of the interesting things about our Art Deco skyscrapers is you, you can tell what they are. They all have these characteristics. You see them in the round, the vertical windows and all of that. But they don't look at all alike. Um, any, any two. I mean, the Daily News building doesn't look anything like the Chrysler building, but it's right. definitely the same period. It's clearly part of the same phenomenon. Any two Art Deco skyscrapers look less alike than any two Gothic cathedrals. I think it's a fair statement, because of this, because it's invented. Now, the same architect is going to use the same ornament from building to building, so you, you know things do, right. do repeat that way. Right. Um, I also noticed that your buildings that you showed were more, mostly from the late '30s, I think, uh, or yes. some of the more. They were really yes. more the modern, the modern version of Art Deco. Uh, they are actually, you're right. Oriented. But they reminded me mostly not of anything I'd seen in New York, but of Miami Beach, uh, which is yes. a tropical climate also, uh, yes. which have therefore yes. the same issues of sunlight and shadow. Uh, yes. In fact, it was remarkable how similar they were. And have, have you, I imagine you've seen pictures of, um, oh, what's that town in uh, New Zealand? Uh, famous for Napier? I'm sorry? Napier? Yes, Napier, Napier, very similar kinds of buildings, and again, tropical. Yeah. Um, and for that matter, the Beaux Arts buildings in Tel Aviv, uh, right. also same issue. It, it, it's you know we respond to our, our environment, uh, you know, no exactly. matter what. Exactly. You can't you can't avoid the environment. 
Definitely. I think what was, although uh, this is something we had noticed while we were comparing a lot of buildings from Miami and Bombay is that Bombay actually has a lot of balconies, which you don't necessarily see in other uh, buildings. Uh, at least we couldn't find them so much in New York, uh, in um, the Miami buildings. Uh, so you could actually use that a lot more in the city of Bombay. We have balconies in, in New York buildings, uh, not so much from the Deco period. They come a little bit later. Uh, they became okay. a big uh, fashion in the 50s. Uh, apart, you know, 20 story apartment houses, uh, you know, right. they do the cantilever, the cantilever floor, right? This is a, right. this is a way of holding up a floor, but if I do that, it's still supporting it. Right? This is the wall of the building, that's the balcony. Um, it always made me very nervous, but they're perfectly safe. Um, yes. And that's, that's when we get them. Definitely. Okay, uh, we actually have uh, uh, one question for you, which I'd like to ha take on. Um, yes, please. So we have uh, Nidin asking, did the deco buildings in Miami come up around the same time as in New York? Uh, if you'd like to take that. Sure, they're a bit late. They're like the ones in Bombay. They tend to be from the late 1930s, mid to late 1930s. Uh, you know, they, these names of styles, um, you know, we throw them around, Art Deco and Modern. Um, you know, they, these are all invented names. They didn't have them at the time. Remember, the skyscrapers were the vertical style. Um, so Miami is picked up on the phrase Art Deco, Miami Beach, and they have a big festival every year, Moon Over Miami, and the Art Deco this and Art Deco that, and I think their entire economy is based on the phrase Art Deco. Well, there's a professor somewhere in South Florida who doesn't like that and says, no, 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 Miami Beach is not Art Deco. Oh, well, what is it? It's resort modern. So oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> get I suppose Bombay is resort modern. I, I don't know. Um, it, but, um, but they're a bit later. They're a different set of architects, but there were some who worked in both cities, one or two. And uh, I will tell you that an uncle of mine, rest in peace, uh, was an architect in the, in the 20s and 30s, and he worked in New York, but he was called up by a friend of his who had moved down to, you know, from the Bronx, who had moved down to Miami and said, you've got, Teddy, you've got to come down. This is the place to be right now. We're, we're doing a lot of building. And Teddy said, I don't think so. Um, so, you know, those connections are very strong. Miami is a thousand miles away from New York, but it's always had a, a you know, a cultural connection. Um, right. Um, I'd actually like to talk, uh, I'd like you to actually talk a little bit about, you know, what are the challenges that you have faced while campaigning and conserving Art Deco buildings in New York? I know you told a little bit that, you know, you have done a lot of work in trying to conserve a lot of these buildings. So if you could tell us a little bit about that or one personal story around some Art Deco building that you saved. We're, we're, actually, we're actually quite fortunate that we've lost very little. Um, in terms, it's, it's, it, nobody. It's, it's very rare to take down a skyscraper. So the Art Deco skyscrapers are are still there, uh, for the most part. Uh, you can do alterations that take off the ornament. That that can happen. We've been lucky. That hasn't really happened to our Art Deco skyscrapers. We have lost smaller buildings. Um, apartment buildings have uh, been refaced. Um, things like that. Uh, the real issue was that for so long, uh, Art Deco was not thought of as an, a, a serious style. Um, you know, in the 19, I came back from graduate school uh, in, to New York in 1976. Um, and we were just, I found a city that was just beginning to wake up to the fact that we had historic architecture. Nobody, you know, we never, we didn't think of ourselves as historic. We're a modern city in the new world, you know, and, and uh, oh, wait a minute. Yes, we do. Um, and um, this phrase Art Deco was still very, very new. I went to work at the Landmarks Commission here in 1979. And uh, I, I was very new, so I had nothing to do with this, but several of my colleagues um, were trying to get those twin towered apartment houses on Central Park West, you saw the century at the beginning, to get them protected. Uh, there's a generation gap at the Landmarks Commission. The commissioners who actually have the votes were all in their 60s and 70s, which at the time seemed awfully right. old to me, not anymore. Um, and the staff were, were, were in our 30s. So the staff brought these uh, Art Deco Twin Tower buildings to this, they were concerned about losing the windows. Uh, and the commissioners looked at them and said, why are you bringing these to us? These aren't historic. I'm older than that building. We had to get past that, we did. Um, you know, today the, uh, we are designating buildings in, uh, that were built in the 1970s and 80s because you have to be at least 30 years old, but 30, year, 30 years isn't that long ago. You know, what's 30 years ago is now 1990. So um, yeah. that wasn't the case when I was there. 
And uh, the latest building to become a landmark that's really is the uh, city core, which went up in the 1970s. And when I heard that, I thought, I'm older than that building. Uh, you know, and this, this, this generational thing happens. But Art Deco is now so firmly established. It took a while. The Chrysler building did not become a landmark until 1978, I think. Landmarks Commission existed from 65. Empire State Building didn't become the Empire State Building, it, you know, so enti tied up with the identity of the city, not until 1981 on its 15th anniversary. The Chrysler Building was in danger of being torn down. It's hard oh. to imagine that now. But in the 70s, when the recession was very, very bad and the real estate you know, the building was, was a bankrupt, and there was talk about tearing it down. Inconceivable now, but um, it did happen. And when we brought them, when they had the public hearing was held, representatives of the building got there and spoke because there's always a public meeting to have these discussions before an official designation is made. And they said, this is an embarrassment that the Landmarks Commission should be looking at such a ugly 1930s building. Why are you bothering? And they were serious. They really meant it. Now today, you can't get in the, it's hard to get in the lobby of the Chrysler building because everybody wants to see it. Tour bus, buses all stop there. Um, you know, it's, it, the change is just enormous. I think part of this is also the parent-grandparent phenomenon. You know, whatever my parents did wasn't, no, that wasn't interesting. Now my grandparents, they were interesting. Uh, so I'm looking at the Art Deco is the, from my, my grandparents' period. Whereas right. the 1950s and 60s, early modern stuff from my parents' period, I never much cared for. I can sort of see its value now, but it took a while. Um, so I don't know if that was the case at all in India, um, but it was certainly the case here. India, uh, we have uh, issues related to age, right? Like we have a lot of buildings that are centuries old. And mm -hmm. even within our own uh, regulations, if the buildings aren't more than 100 years old, not a lot of those buildings actually get listed. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have issues with those that we're trying to deal. Although I would say now things are getting a lot better because there are a lot of people who are understanding that uh, you know, modern buildings are at a significant threat of being lost because they're so recent and so um, part of our everyday life that we don't necessarily see them as heritage, right? We, we actually look at them as though we live and breathe in them. And that sort of takes away from this whole notion of heritage, which most people in India see as a monument or as, you know, ruined sites. And even Art Deco buildings for that matter in Bombay still are uh, used extensively. There are people who have lived there, uh, who mm -hmm. have lived there from the time it was actually built, you know, mm -hmm. so there are generations of people who are living in it. So um, although there's a high associational value, uh, I think it's taken time for people to really look at it as heritage or look at it as something that they like to preserve and take forward, which is why I think in our case, the um, World Heritage Site nomination came in at a very opportune time because uh, with that coming in, there are a lot, there's a lot more interest in people wanting to learn about Art Deco, know what it is. And, you know, there are so many people on our walks who have literally gone back saying that, oh, I have something like this at my home. I didn't mm. know it was Art Deco, you know. And mm -hmm. now they have that knowledge. They know that it's something that is priceless and they are now custodians to um, other sets of landmarks that, you know, possibly should be preserved and cherished. So, Education. Uh, I was going to say education is so important. I mean, you do walking tours. We do walking tours here, uh, because it's we're all busy. You know, people are busy. We're, we who's got time to look at? Oh, wait a minute. You know, let's let's look. Good heavens, look at that. Um, and it, it, that was a huge part of the preservation movement was educating the wider public. Because without support from the wider public, preservation isn't going to happen. Uh, at least not in a democracy. Um, yeah. So um, you are doing very very good work. By bringing people Thank around, you. <laughs> so it's it's good to see. Um, also, you know, age. India is a very old country, and uh, we're we're not. Uh, Four hundred years old is very old here. You know, we go out to what yes. Los Angeles, maybe a century old, maybe a little bit more. Um, go to Europe, and it's like India. Everything's very old. I was invited to Rome, oh, 20, 30 years ago, to give a talk on historic preservation um, in New York. So okay. I, did, I made a preservation. I called it 300 years of historic preservation in the meaning of the buildings, not the preservation part. They translated yeah. it as preserving the modern. And right. I said, no, no, it's not, it's not just, you know, our modern skyscrapers. We have 19th century, we even have a few 18th century buildings. And they said, yes, modern. 
completely different perspective on what modern meant. Um, yes. Yes, I think that's what's happening in India as well. It's actually very interesting because right now we're trying to, uh, there are a lot of organizations, a lot of professionals who are trying to really figure out and sort of bring to light what is modern in India, in the Indian context, and you know how we should preserve it, how we should look at it differently. Because also another thing which is interesting about all these modern buildings is they were built using uh, concrete, right? And uh, reinforced concrete cement as a material is still used today. Even the newest of buildings today use that material. So even in terms of materiality, it doesn't feel like it's an old building or it's something that needs to be preserved or conserved. You're just trying to look at it in a very different way. And that's where I think this modern space or buildings from the 20th century sit at a very interesting position right now where, you know, materials might not look as old or it might not seem like it's an old building, but they are in danger and they are in real danger as much as all the other monuments are in trying to preserve, uh, you know, such buildings. Do you have a chapter of Dako Momo in uh, Mumbai? We, not in Mumbai, we have that in India. Uh, it's very recently that they have started. Uh, we have actually another question, uh, which is a very interesting question that I'd like to ask you uh, specifically. Uh, we have a party asking, what uh, did we stop, why did we stop making our deco buildings really? So if you could answer that, that would be clear. Sure. You know, it's interesting, that question, I, I've heard that question before, and, and it, the first time I heard that question, I thought, I, I don't know. And, and then I thought, well, yeah, uh, because fashions change. Uh, it's, it's very simple. Why, why, do the why does the clothing that we're wearing today not look like the clothing that we wore 30 years ago? Because generally it doesn't. I mean, mine probably does, uh, but, but, other, but other people's don't. Uh, people get bored and move on. I mean, I think it's something as simple as that. What's, what's in this year will be out next year. Um, and, but there's also that, you know, the, the fashion that came next in architecture was the international style. Uh, and the international style had a huge impact on American architecture, especially in cities. Um, and it was, you know, the Art Deco folks thought that they were inventing their ornament and doing something new, but from the perspective of the international style, oh, this is fake modernism. You've just pasted some geometric patterns on your building, but you haven't changed the way you're building. It looks just like any other apartment house, except you put deco stuff on it. Uh, you need to rethink it. We need lots of light and air. We need glass. We need to austere. We need all form, you know, form follows function, all ornament is crime, all of that. Uh, from that perspective, art deco is anti-architecture. Uh, it, and it was uh, looked down on as, you know, a fraud effectively, not really modern. We'll show you what's really modern. It's the Lever House, right? The very, one of the very first um, Art Deco, uh, pardon me, uh, international style skyscrapers to go up. So that, that had a huge piece of it. And there's also a certain of kind of a snobbery involved. Uh, the architects doing the Art Deco buildings in New York were New Yorkers. Um, a lot of the ones doing the apartment houses were immigrants who didn't have much training, uh, but they learned how to do it. Uh, well, the architects who were designing the skyscrapers in the international style at first were refugees from Europe during the 30s. Uh, you know, um, uh, think of uh, Walter Gropius, uh, think of uh, Mies van der Rohe. Um, and we've always had this sort of inferiority complex. Oh, well, they're, they're from Europe. They, they must know. Uh, we'll, we'll do what they say, um, you know, and uh, to, our, to our cost. Uh, I mean, Lever House is a wonderful building. That's by that's that's uh, American. That's Skidmore's and Merrill. They they are the American firm who picked it up. But my gosh, you know Seagram. You, that's that's practically sacred. That that's a Mies van der Rohe skyscraper. Uh, he's a real architect. He's from Germany. You know, I mean, it's a, it's a funny phenomenon. I, I wonder if you have the same issue in uh, in India. Actually, that's interesting because that's also another thing that we do quite uh, a lot while we are researching and putting our stuff out there is that a lot of times uh, we don't know which Indian architect built our deco buildings because it was the first generation of Indian architects who were really building and exploring um, the style in, the, in Mumbai at that point in time, even in India for that matter. So uh, to our research, we are trying to talk a lot about that. And I think that's very important. It's important for us to know that because even today, we talk a lot about Frederick William Stephen, who was this um, uh, uh, British architect who actually designed one of our beautiful uh, Gothic monuments in the city. But no one knows so much about Indian architects like Master Sate Bhuta, G.B. Matre, even uh, you know, uh, talking about how they built so many very significant uh, cities, 
that are part of the cultural landscape of the city at this point in time. Uh, so it's interesting that we have so many similar uh, issues, even though we are in two different cities that are completely far apart uh, and, you know, have many things between them as well. So, um, yeah, definitely. I was going to say, well, what we share is the uh, British colonial past. Uh, oh, definitely, know, yes. It's more definitely. recent for you than for us, obviously, uh, but it's there. Um, yes. I mean, when, when, you know, in 1981, my wife hates going to bed late. She'll, she'll, go, she'll be in bed by 9.30. But right. in 1981, she stayed up until four in the morning, along with millions of other Americans, to watch what on television? The marriage of Prince Charles and Lady Diana Spencer. <laughs> and you know, my wife's, it, my wife's uh, or, uh, gene genealogy doesn't go anywhere near Britain, uh, right. Central America, uh, Spain, and Poland but she had to see it. And if it had been the Prince of Spain or the Prince of Poland or the president of Costa Rica, she'd have been fast asleep and so would everybody else. We, we still have this odd obsession or sense of connection because we speak the same, well, we sort of speak the same language. It's actually a little, there are differences that can get you in trouble, but it's basically the same language. Um, right. The other thing I'd, I'd just point out about us, I don't know if it's, it's true for you or not. Um, until I, I studied, uh, I was in college in uh, 1968 uh, taking an art history class for the first time. And we touched very briefly on American architecture. And we learned that there were two kinds, colonial and modern. Whatever was in between was of no value whatsoever. Now that of course has completely changed. Uh, right. People, you know, Victorian architecture is now not considered something shameful, it's something beautiful. Uh, the same is true of Art Deco, but it took time to get there. I think we have something similar, but we are getting there as well. I think we have a lot of emphasis. And I think now uh, more than ever, especially since the, incept, uh, in, uh, the inscription, we have a lot of emphasis and a lot of people talking about modern heritage and trying to really explore, uh, you know, what are the other styles of architecture that you can see in the country and in different Indian cities, uh, other than just the Gothic style or the Renaissance style or, you know, uh, the ancient uh, monuments that we have in the city. Um, I think I will have to stop us uh, from talking any further because we've overshot by quite uh, uh, some time now. Uh, but thank you so much, Tony. This was really wonderful. I learned so much about uh, the Art Deco style and even um, the different kinds of Art Deco buildings that you can see in uh, New York. And there's so many similarities in terms of just the need for light and air being used to create all these different kinds of buildings to, uh, you know, just the expression of um, American architects creating Art Deco buildings and really expressing the social, cultural, uh, you know, um, the times uh, that they were living in in such beautiful manners on different tangible uh, with such a tangible outcomes. So really, thank you so much for uh, spending this time with us and giving us so much time and uh, in helping us understand these buildings so beautifully. Mm -hmm.